All right, sorry for being a bad person. All right, so <clears throat> we're going to start a new chapter. It's chapter four. And it's on um, kinematics of uh, rigid bodies. So what is kinematics? Study of motion. Um, so that's the root of the word, right? What is the difference between kinematics and dynamics, which also studies motion? The force? So in kinematics, um, I guess you can see it as more geometrical. So you can come up with um, relationships between acceleration, velocity, position, but you don't really care about what causes the force. So we're gonna look at kinematics first, and then um, later we'll look at dynamics. Next question, I guess, is uh, in the title. What is a rigid body? What is it? talked about them before. We gave a definition, actually. Mm -hmm. So, I guess, uh, you know, very deep, there's no distinction, but uh, are you talking about a physical or a mathematical constraint? Physical constraint. So, what is constraining the object? Uh, the fact that you cannot be disassociated from each other. Like, the particle moves, like, in, along the motion, the particle do not intercede. Mm -hmm. So, it's just the body moves. So, they maintain their structure, or I guess the arrangement of the particles remains the same. Okay? Um, and of course, you can also express that as um, holonomic constraints, right? So you say, um, I guess you can have one constraint for each atom, um, if you have like an absolute frame of reference, or you can give the constraints uh, in terms of the other particles. So um, there is something else. Well, actually, I, I think that's completely correct. Um, now I have a few questions. Uh, this table, see a rigid body? Yes, what about um, the laptop? For the most part. What about the chair you're sitting on? Yes? Are you sure? What about a human body or I guess an animal? What about a bone versus a liver? So if our definition of a rigid body means that we have a constraint for each particle, um, if you have something that is uh, squishy, maybe, I don't know, like a soccer ball or something in which you know, the shape actually changes, 
then by definition that is not rigid. You might be applying a force, you know, something might be going on, but if the distance between the particles changes or the shape of the object changes, then it is not, um, by definition, a rigid body. And so if you think about it, um, probably nothing is a rigid body. Maybe you know, a black hole or something really in the extreme. But everything is, well, most things are approximately rigid bodies you know, to um, better or worse approximation. So I guess for simplicity, we can treat a lot of things as uh, rigid bodies. If they break or bend, then that changes things. So if we have n particles, you know, we assume that each particle, you know, has a, a mass, we can assume that it's the same mass, um, so that they look a little bit like atoms. If we have n particles in our body, how many degrees of freedom do we have? Three n. That is, we didn't have any constraints. So with the constraints, how many do we have? Mm -hmm. Number of independent constraints. Because one way to define the constraint will be to say, you know, um, the distance between atom or particle I um, and particle J uh, is a constant. But then you have this for every i and every j, um, as long as i is different than j. And you know, if n is large, then the number of constraints actually is larger than the number of, um, of particles. So I guess the degrees of freedom uh, increase with linearly with the number of particles, but the number of constraints increases quadratically. These are not independent constraints, as we will see, though. Um, so I guess just from your intuition, or maybe you know the answer, how many degrees of freedom does a rigid body, you know, let's say this marker, has, including all constraints, including all particles. If we want to describe it with uh, generalized coordinates, how many coordinates do we need? Three? Are you sure? Did you say three? Six. Six. Why? Oh, yeah. So you need three coordinates to describe you know, the position of the center of mass, for example. Because it could be any point inside the, the marker. And then you need the rotations, right? So one, two, and three. So let's see if we can get to those um, six degrees of freedom. So the, the book, Goldstein, actually has an, in, an interesting way of, um, of doing this. I liked it. says that if you have a rigid body, and maybe something that looks like that. Let me see if I have a better marker.
So you have your rigid body, it looks like whatever. And inside of it, you define a plane. It's maybe something that looks like that. How many points do you need to define a plane? Two will define a line. And chairs are inefficient. You actually need less than four. Three. Three. You need three points that uh, should be non-collinear. Right, so if they're, um, let's say, the same x, then you have in reality two, and so you define the line. But if you have, um, in most cases, if you have three points, you define a plane. So then you need three points inside of the rigid body to define um, I guess to define the generalized um, coordinates. So how many coordinates do you need to describe the first, the second, and the third point? Well, for the first one, you need Three coordinates. You know, in Euclidean space. Um, you know, there's no way around it. You have to define it in terms of x, y, and z. What about point two? Which are what? So we know that it's going to be a distance um, R one, two, I guess, from point one, and this is one of the constraints that we have. Um, but you know, in addition to that, it can be on any part of the plane. Actually, it's not a plane yet, right? It could be anywhere uh, in a sphere around one. So I guess it will be the equivalent to beta and phi in spherical coordinates. And for this one, we have x, y, and z. What about the third point? I guess there's several ways to answer that. The first way is, well, we know that we need that we need six, six um, coordinates and we already have five. So six minus five, that's one. Um, what is the other way to think about it? Well, with points one and two, you can create a sphere. Um, but you know, that's uh, a volume. So if you want to create a plane, you need to give it an orientation. So then um, two and three actually, because they are connected, are two, three, and R one, three. Um, they'll be rotating or moving on the plane. So this is a, a rotation. 
So you know, the first one, I guess is kind of equivalent to having sensor of mass. Then for point two, we describe how it can move around point one. And then the last point defines uh, the orientation. So I will try to, uh, we know this, I'm gonna try to draw it in a nicer way. So we have X, Y, and Z. Point one, I guess I'm just gonna call it one. Um, it's there. And then point two, and this is given by X, Y, and Z. <laughs> Point two is going to be over here. And it can move around. Well, it's going to create the, the shell around one. So it looks like that. So over here, mm, yeah, it's fine. I'm gonna use solid red. All right, so it can move kind of in beta and phi. And then um, finally, we're going to have point this is R12. We're going to have, say, point 0.3 over here. So that is going to define, these two have to rotate at the same time um, if you're doing this. So this is going to define the R, essentially, um, R hat. So what we have over here is one coordinate system and another one here that also has orthogonal vectors so it will be like uh, r delta and and phi right so the orientation could be anything but because it is orthogonal you might as well call it x y and z so Maybe it's gonna look kind of like this. So you know, we can call it X prime. This one should be like this. Y prime and Z prime. So you have two coordinate systems. And we can say several things about the relationships between these two coordinate systems. So,
the first one, I guess the first set, comes from the definition of dot product. So the dot product A dot B is equal to what? Magnitude of A. Magnitude of A? What else? Magnitude of B. Magnitude of B. Between A and B. Okay. So with that relationship, we're going to have can define over here. This is going to be I hat, J hat and k hat. And over here we're going to have i hat prime, j hat prime, and k hat prime. So these are the unitary, uh, the unit vectors. So their magnitude is 1. So if we multiply, for example, I hat dot jet hat prime. What is that? There's a prime over there. So it will be zero if they are perfectly uh, aligned. In general, they are not. So cosine of theta i j prime. J prime. Yeah. Cool. So we just have cosines over here. So I'm going to. Why not? Because so. The dot product between i hat and j hat is zero. This is j hat prime. Is the other um, the other uh, orthogonal system, right? So remember, you have this one, which tells you where your center of mass is, your rigid body is, and then this one tells you the orientation of the rigid body. So, you know, maybe you're lucky, or unlucky, I don't know, and these two align, and then it will be zero. But in general, you know, it's very unlikely that they're going to align. So you have the two different um, Cartesian uh, coordinates. So I'm going to write down all of them. Mm. It is on purpose that I want to write down all. So, okay, cosine one prime one. I had prime dot I cosine theta one prime two is I had prime dot J hat and cosine one three is I had dot J no uh, K and two is prime. Okay, so we can get the other ones. Dot J 
jhat and jhat prime dot a hat. So we have nine different angles. That is more than the than the six degrees of freedom. So by putting the terms together, we get that I have prime I hat prime is going to be this one in the direction of I hat, this one in the direction of J hat, this one in the direction of K hat. So we get similar relationships for the other ones. Cool. So as expected, um, we can represent i, j, and k in general by their components in h, i hat prime, j hat prime, k, k, k hat prime in the components of i hat, j hat, and k hat. So it's a good thing. So now we're going to consider a vector, and this vector is going to be anywhere. So I guess we can put it over here. And this vector is called R. So we can represent R in terms of the unit vectors. So is x prime in the I have prime direction? plus y prime in the j hat prime direction plus z prime in the k hat prime direction. So we know what the directions are. So r is x, x prime times that. I guess I'm going to start uh, to stop writing the, the, the prime, but just remember that the first index refers to D 
this um, frame of reference, the, the prime one. So one one. in the k hat j hat and k hat directions plus y prime is to one to two So there is a direct substitution of um, i hat prime, j hat prime, and k hat prime. Trouble with the last one. So we can represent vector r in terms of i hat, j hat, and k hat. So it's going to be x prime. direction J hat start to see the pattern. K hat. So of course we can represent or we can express the vector R in terms of either frame of reference. So We know this. What is our vector dot I hat? So this term over here is r hat, um, sorry, r vector dot i hat. This one over here this one over here. R vector dot j hat and R vector dot k hat. Okay, so just like we expressed um, I hat as a function. I had prime 
yeah, and we had the, the I, J, and K components. We can do the same thing with um, the unprimed I. So that's gonna give us So that means that x prime is equal to that, right? You can see it over here. Y prime is equal to that, and Z prime is equal to this one. So we can get X prime in terms of everything else. prime is going to be that. So it's x cosine theta 1 1 plus y cosine theta 1 2 plus z cosine theta 1 3. We did the dot product so we don't um, we don't have a direction. It's just the addition. Then we have um, R. Oh, this one is times. Okay, oh, fine. I deleted it. Okay, so x, y, and z. This one's gonna be x cosine theta to one no So um, what is this one? R vector dot i. Is equal to what? to x, 
right? So the prime we get the x prime. So this one is equal to y, and this one is equal to z. So we can put this stuff um, Sorry, I guess we're getting the, um, the dot product. So x is this one in here. Without direction. So this one is y, and this one is z. Okay, so we can put this stuff in here. Uh, this one in here and this one in here. So then we'll have um, x prime in terms of x prime, y prime, and z prime, and these cosines over here. So I'm going to do it for x prime. I guess we can see the first step. You know, it's just going to be this one times this one. So then we can um, aggregate the terms or associate the terms, and we're going to end up with mm, Okay. Um, I did it the other way around. It doesn't matter. So instead of using um, x prime, I'm going to use x. So this one is cosine squared theta 1 1 plus cosine um, squared theta 2 1 plus cosine square theta 3 1 plus y cosine theta 1 2 um, cosine theta 1 1 cosine theta 2 2 Cosine theta two one, cosine theta three two, cosine theta three one. This is y. Uh, and z is going to be cosine theta 
one three cosine theta one one cosine theta two three cosine theta two one cosine theta three three and cosine theta three one. Okay. So we have x equals this times this, this times this. Sorry. This plus this plus this. Uh, but these ones are being multiplied. So what can we tell about the stuff that we have in here inside the parentheses? Which ones? The last two ones. This one is zero. Oh, like the sum, the sum of the three terms. The sum of the three terms should be zero. You mean this one plus this one plus this one? Mm -hmm. Like inside of the parent or the bracket. Oh, this sum. This one plus this one plus this one. So whatever is inside the square brackets is equal to zero. Um, except for this one, so let's use curly brackets. What is this one equal to? One. So uh, we can do the same thing for Why is that the first one is equal to one? Because uh, x equals x. So that means that this whole thing should be equal to one, and then y and z should be equal to zero. Yeah, it's not, it's not like a trigonometric identity. It's just um, in this particular case. So we can do the same thing for uh, y. And C, and we're going to get it's the same structure. Um, these ones are going to be cosine squares for the y equals y, and um, for z equals z. So, yes, the relation between x prime and x, the relation between x prime and x. Mm -hmm. How did it? Get the other the second relation. Um like the relation considering the relation between x prime and x and then the relation between x and x. How did you from x prime relating to x? How did you get x? So I guess I deleted the part that I should not have deleted, but you have uh, this relationship or well, this relationship. for uh, x prime, y prime, and z prime. And you're going to have the same relationships. It's gonna be x equals r dot i, y equals r dot j, and z equals r dot k. And we know, we derived them over here. Uh, we know what i hat, j hat, and k hat are. And we also derived uh, i hat prime, j hat prime, k hat prime. So, and we know the definition of, um, of the vector r. So we have everything we need, and it's just algebra to get these equations. So you could get either you know, x equals x blah plus y blah plus z blah, or you could have done it with x prime, but the results are going to be the same. You get the cosine squared one one, cosine squared two one, cosine squared three one.
um, for the term that is you know, equal. Did that answer your question? Yeah. So is it um, x equal to all of that, or x prime equal to all of that? Um, this is the end result. x equals, and then this is in x, y, and z. They are not primed. Okay. So the point um, is that we want these relationships, the ones that are inside the brackets. So if we do it for y, what we're going to get is, um, I'm going to, let me see. I'm going to put it over here. So for y, we're going to have. I'm just going to put this last form. I mean, it's just algebra. So it's going to be x cosine theta 1, 1 um, cosine theta 1, 2 cosine theta 2, 1 a plus sign that shouldn't be there. Um, two plus cosine theta three one cosine theta three two. Plus y and this one is cosine squared theta one two cosine square theta two two cosine square theta three two So the structure looks similar, but we have the terms that are squared in y. So y equals this stuff. We know that this should be equal to 0. This should be equal to 1. And this one should also be equal to zero. So I didn't do z, but you get the idea, right? So actually, you could get it just from the patterns. So this one is going to have. going to have cosine square 1, 3, um, cosine square, uh, it's going to be, yeah, 2, 3, cosine square 3, 3. Right, so some stuff over here that is going to be a permutation of these values, and the same thing here. So this one has to be equal to 1, and the other two have to be equal to 0. So this is just patterns. So 
we can write them in We can write it as a sum. Can you see the pattern? So let's call the first number or the first index L and the other one M. So maybe I can get rid of this one over here. So if we want to write it for x, how do we do it? Sum from L equals 1 to what? 3. Cosine squared. L, um, beta L? One. One. Good. Um, should be equal to what? Okay. And then we're going to get another one from Y. That one's going to be L. We again have one, two, three. So what is the, the same but what? It's going to be L2 equals 1. And you can you know, complete uh, the Z1 is going to be equal to this. So I guess more compactly we can say that sum of L from 1 to 3 cosine square theta L M equals 1 uh, for yeah I guess that's that's it so M is going to be from one, two, three. And the other ones, they're a little bit more difficult to see. So I guess I will just write them down over here so that you can get them from the pattern. It's going to be sum of L from one to three, cosine theta L. Um, M prime. Now you need M and M prime. Cosine theta L M equals zero. And this one is for M different than M prime. And that's the pattern that you can find over here. So this is kind of cool. How many um, I guess independent degrees of freedom do we have? There's a, a more compact way of writing them down. Have you heard about the Kronecker delta? Yeah. What is it? OK. 
okay? How is that different from a delta function? Yeah. So in counter delta, the notation is just a delta. Then you know the two things that might or might not be equal. So over here we'll have Lm equals one if L equals M and zero if L is different than M but these ones are gonna be rewritten as uh, equals the Kronecker Delta for M prime and M. Okay. So yeah, this one makes sense. So if M prime equals M, then that's equal to one. And if M prime equals N, then these two are the same and you get the cosine squared. If they are different, so here by definition, uh, m and m prime are different, then this is going to be equal to zero. So it's actually a pretty cool result. Have you seen anything like that before? With the with the definition of a one and zero in an operation. So I guess over here, or L and M is just like the example, right? So um, if these two are equal, then you get the one. If they're this one, this one. Okay, what is your question? You're relating that one to this one. Like I want to know the relationship between L and M. Because when L is not equal to M, then the summation is one. Right, so this one is representing uh, these values over here. So L and M are the indices of the, um, I guess, of the two uh, Cartesian systems. Well, why is it equal to one? Is it when L is equal to um, so here, because you have the square, so if you spell it out, it'll be cosine theta one one cosine theta one one, right? Um, but otherwise, you I guess, I guess maybe I should have spelled it out. Um, this one has to be equal to one because you have the x over here, and these ones have to be equal to zero because they are not x. So the the, the that relationship with the Kronecker delta is just saying this, but more compactly and in general. So both for x, y, and z. But uh, like we did not define L and M. Is it that is. Let, let me let me change that. Well, so L. I was also going to ask. Um, for the first component of x, when x is equal to x, you know we have three components. That's mm -hmm. cos square theta, theta one one, cos square theta two one, and cos square theta three one. Is there any of the three components that is there? It could be. 
you don't know uh, in general, you, you just know that that sum is equal to one. One, okay. It, it could be, sure. depends on the orientation of the partition plan, um, systems. Okay, uh, but, mm, so here we're just saying that same thing, but very compactly. Have you seen, um, I guess, situations in which you have rules like this? You know, blah equals one and blah equals zero? When you say add or common or mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, these are, uh, they come from the uh, orthogonality, right? Actually, they're orthonormal. So that has to happen whenever you have a, um, a vector um, space. And actually, it's more general than that. It doesn't have to be a vector. So what are the conditions to have a mathematical space? You need, if I remember correctly, four definitions. You need to be able to define the equivalent of a zero. So you need this definition. Um, a plus zero equals A. So the other one is one. One times A equals a and you need this definition of the of the dot product so mm, I don't know how to write that one let's just call it a dot b when it is equal to one and when it is equal to zero okay so Euclidean space has those properties. We can define um, a vector that when you add it to another vector, you get the same vector. So it'll be the zero vector. You can also find um, a number, in this case, number one, that when you multiply a vector times number one, you get the same vector. And then you get you know, when um, the dot product is equal to one, so the two um, axes are orthogonal and when they're equal to zero so when they are you know, at a 90 degree angle so the cool thing about this is that you know we derived it for the case um, in which I guess a Euclidean space case but this is more general you can invent um, the space that you want if you just find if you define an operation and a zero, an operation, multiplication operation, and a one. And they don't have to look anything like, you know, our regular multiplication or addition. And a 